Good evening. Uh, on behalf of uh, Grey Bruce Sustainability Network and United Way Grey Bruce, I would love to welcome you this evening. I'm super stoked to be part of our community guidance network and building this network together, offering you support and creating beautiful welcoming spaces in this region. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Simona Freberkova, and for the last two years, I've been kicking for the GB Sasnet and also growing with the Mifred Community Gardens. My goal is to inspire people to grow local organic food in our communities, either on your own or in the community settings, and also share the surplus and reach out to more people to share the love of growing. Tonight's intentions, uh, my tonight's intention is to connect uh, and share skills and knowledge. My intention is to also inspire you to plant trees, edible trees, because they, among other things, give us oxygen, store carbon, stabilize and fix the soil, and also provide us food. So even if you don't have a green thumb or you've never planted a tree, you must love to eat good food. So before I introduce our speaker tonight, I would love to acknowledge and give sincere thank you to First Nations as the traditional keepers of this land. And also uh, sit back, relax, and let's go with the love and flow. So tonight, um, for tonight's webinar, I'm happy to introduce you Thomas Dean who will share with us his designing experience with Food Forest. Uh, Thomas uh, is a Mifred resident and his focus is primarily on the design of sacred healing and community spaces. Thomas' uh, recent and ongoing projects are the CMHA Food Forest at St. George's Park in Owen Sound, the Gitche Name Wigwedon Reconciliation Garden, the sculpture garden uh, at the gallery and the labyrinth at Christchurch Anglican in Mifford. So let's sit uh, and enjoy Thomas' presentation. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks, Simona. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for joining in. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, delighted to have been asked to, uh, to, to share a few thoughts with you. Um, we need to start when we're thinking about a food forest and um, all of you will be thinking about it for different reasons. You may wanna do it. You may wanna know more about it. You may wanna be part of a group that's thinking about it. You may um, have one already going, um, but um, whenever we think about a food forest, we have to just back up a bit and think about um, I can't move my slide, there we go. We have to think about permaculture a little bit. Permaculture derives its name from permanent agriculture or permanent culture. And um, here's one of many, it, you know, the more you look, the more you'll find a different definition. But in, And here's one, and I'll read it if I may, I'm not gonna read all my slides. Permaculture is the conscious design and maintenance of agriculturally productive ecosystems, which have the diversity, stability, and resilience of natural ecosystems. It's the harmonious integration of landscape and people, providing their food, energy, shelter, and other material and non-material needs in a sustainable way. So it's really, if I can paraphrase that, um, permaculture is an approach to land management that adopts natural arrangements and relationships that already exist and are observed in, in nature. Um, it includes a set of design principles derived using what's called whole systems thinking. This is like big picture stuff. Um, whole system thinking is really a method of understanding how elements interact in support of one another and act as a system. So it uses these design principles in fields of study such as regenerative agriculture, rewilding, and community resilience. So very much, um, very much beyond sustainability in a lot of ways in that it's restorative. 
which I think is a word that we need to be thinking more and more about. Um, uh, we've got a lot of restorative activities to do. So congratulations for your interest in this whole um, area of study. When we think about food forest, and I have to be honest, uh, until I met Teresa Pearson, uh, some years ago, it was either late 2015 or early 2016, it, um, it was, uh, I don't even think I knew the expression. Um, and probably in the first three minutes of our conversation, Teresa said, I want to do a food for us. So a big shout out of thanks to Teresa for inspiring me to explore this further and for um, uh, for being the driving force behind what exists and continues to evolve um, at St. George's. So, um, first of all, food forest itself is a little bit of redundancy in that, as, as uh, Simona properly pointed out, um, the forest is food, um, among many other things. It's, it happens to be shelter, it happens to be uh, an oxygenator, an air conditioner, um, a filter, um, a carbon sink, and uh, so many other wonderful things. So, um, so calling it a food forest is maybe a bit um, of redundancy, but it's it just rolls off the, the tongue so nicely. So, food forest is very much a form of permaculture. If you look up, if you go to study food forests or look up any references about food forests, you won't get very far without running into permaculture, which we've just discussed a little bit. So consider it a chapter of or a branch of. Um, and although it mimics a natural system, um, it's not generally a naturally occurring community of plants uh, because um, you're going to want to put plants of your choice in this, in this uh, food forest and uh, a natural community, uh, the trees kind of choose who they want to be with, right? So if you look at a natural forest community, you'll see the same combinations of trees generally appearing together in one place because they enjoy the same climate, the same habitat, the same exposure on one or the other side of a valley. Um, so um, forests have all the experience they need to create their own communities and they do so very well. I'm, I'm blessed in my backyard to have uh, um, maple trees growing with happily with hemlocks and ironwood and at ground level enjoying all that leaf mulch that, that decomposes over the years. Uh, we have ramps, wild leaks there, and trillium and things like that going on. So it's very much undisturbed and I'm leaving it so, but um, forests know how to do this all by themselves. Um, so you'll often see the food forest described as, as layers of plants. And um, there's some debate as to how many layers we should be considering, but this this is a, a generally accepted way of looking at the at the food forest. So we've got the tall we've got the tall trees, the tree canopy. Then we have the sub canopy a little lower down, um, which would be smaller trees, larger shrubs. Then we've got a shrub layer. We've got the herbaceous layer working our way down. That would be the the um, the wildflowers and herbs and things like that. We've got ground cover. We've got underground, which are the, the, the root crops. And then we've got vertical climbers as well. So this is, there's generally seven layers. I've seen um, others added, but um, this is generally accepted, I think. So if you're starting out, and well done if you are. Um, you really want to think about um, why you're doing this. And I really strongly encourage you to write it down. Um, 
and go back to it whenever you're making decisions and just see uh, and, and change it if necessary on the way because um, things will change. You'll learn things that'll make you uh, change what you're doing and how you're doing it. But are you doing it for, to, to generate maximum food or is, are you doing it as a restorative project? Um, is it for health and well being of those involved? Um, is it a community outreach and engagement project? Uh, is it a teaching center? Um, it's probably going to be all of these in some combination, I would, I would suggest. So it may become a matter of prioritizing things um, a little bit so that you can, you can make decisions based on this vision and stay faithful to it. So again, you either have a site or you're looking for one. Um, and here's a few considerations. Um, is it public land? Is it, in other words, uh, our, our project at um, St. George's Park is on uh, city park land. And that has its own little sets of, um, of challenges and opportunities. Um, if it's privately owned, um, How's it zoned? That's going to in influence, for instance, what you can do on it, um, what you can build on it, and um, access to it in terms of uh, driveway entrances and all kinds of things like that. Very important to know what it used to be in terms of what may have been growing there. Uh, it might be, it might have underground, who knows what, um, storage tanks that. Um, might be hazardous ground. Uh, very important to know what the former use is and really important to understand what the neighboring activities are. If they're spraying the fields all around you um, with pesticides, you're, you know, you're not gonna wanna attract pollinators to that trap. Um, Accessibility to the site will be really important. So if you're, if you're, uh, we have the good fortune to be right downtown. Um, so the people that you want to engage here um, in terms of volunteers and participants, uh, you want to be sure they're able to get there easily. We, we have the good fortune and people can bike or walk from uh, most areas to get to our project. Um, but you wanna make sure that the people, uh, if, if there's a bus route, that's great. Uh, or if there's volunteers that are willing to pick people up and get them there, that's great, but just a consideration. Uh, water supply and catchment's important. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, there could be water on the site now in terms of, um, um, in terms of swales, ditches, uh, standing water, all, all considerations. Insurance will come to play uh, whether or not it's uh, public or privately owned because presumably you'll be having people come and go to help you out. So you wanna make sure that your insurance coverage is, uh, is appropriate. Structures and permits will be um, kind of defined by the zoning as we talked about a little bit earlier. And even the police may wanna get involved if it's public property, especially, um, because they they like everything to be see through in terms of uh, uh, not providing um, uh, places for people to to camp out when they shouldn't be and for people to hide in bushes and things like that. Um, they had something to say about our project at St. George's in, in light of that. So those are kind of site considerations to think about. Next, you go to Staples with this little shopping list and buy this stuff because you have to, you have to plan it out. Um, don't just start sticking things in the ground. Um, and I'll, sh I'll show you why that's important in just a minute. But um, the approaches to landscape design include these, these first two things under the plan. Um, and first, First, you wanna do a site inventory. And this is whether or not you've got an existing site or you're looking, um, you wanna do a site inventory. And that is simply 
making a note of everything that's there without judgment. Don't don't worry about judgment at this point. Just make a note of whatever's there. You've got these three big walnut trees are on the property, or you have a fence. You just write everything down that's there uh, in, in detail. That's a start. Um, site analysis is when you put some judgment to what you've got there. Okay, we've got three big walnut trees, but they're shading this part of the property or um, the jugloan that they emit are gonna cause problems with what I plant underneath them. Or this is when you sort of assess um, or, or judge the elements of the site inventory. Um, note anything that has to do with microclimate. In other words, if it's open and windswept, that may be a factor affecting um, uh, plant survival in the area. If it's sheltered in, in a valley, and um, it might be quite the opposite. It might give you uh, uh, opportunity to plant plants that might otherwise not survive. So make any notes about that. Um, Find out where the sun is and observe the site at different times of day just to understand what the existing canopy or the existing foliage, if any, um, is going to do to your site plan. And the orientation is very important too, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover that in the next slide here a little bit. So draw it, that's my advice. So you can see going back to our layers that um, if we use if we if we planted things the way they showed them on the little layer diagram, and I don't think that was necessarily a suggestion, we've got a heck of a lot of shade here. Now that can be good or not good, but generally it's easier to create shade than than find the sun um, on a site. So there's a whole lot of things that won't work in that shaded area to the left, but they may be things that you wanna grow. Um, certainly in terms of ground cover, you're, you're, um, you're pretty limited. Um, although in the shade you can grow, you can easily grow ramps and uh, wild ginger and winter green, and there's all kinds of things that will very happily survive in the shade at ground, ground cover level. But I suggest that the ideal would be to, when you look at the, at, the, uh, at the tall tree, is to step it down gradually to working to the right so that you've got opportunity for sun. We'll still have shade under, shade to play with, but that'll give you the most opportunity to step it down to the right. Um, and ideally, orient the tall trees in um, an east to west direction. And you can see why that would give you the most opportunity for, um, it's just the same, for the same reason that you would orient raised beds north south, ideally, if you're just not shading um, too much of your, um, of your produce that way. Pardon me, I'm just gonna have a little sip of water here. So you can also find um, all the stuff's available. Um, you can also find um, sun angles for our latitude easily online. You can get a table of sun angles so you can actually plot out. Um, you don't have to go there every hour and see where the shadows are. You can actually plot this out if you if you're so interested. So moving along, here's one of the few the huge things about a natural forest is it, it just has developed this beautiful synergy among all the all the participants, if you like. Um, the interdependence of things is is vital to the health um, of, of the food forest garden. So 
you'd be thinking about pollinators, uh, bees, birds, bats, um, wind dispersal, things like that. Um, obviously seed dispersal goes directly with that. Anything that eats and digests and, and uh, leaves behind the, the seed somewhere else is all good. All the beneficial organisms that are, uh, that are chomping away in the soil, you know, creating nutrients and uh, mulching things for you, like the little pill bugs do. Um, you have the beneficial uh, pest control guys, like the bats and, uh, and the, uh, many of the wasp species are, are good guys and, and bugs too. Um, You want to think a bit about, um, let's think about nitrogen fixing a bit. You've heard about it, but uh, if you look at the top right picture, you'll see um, an example of a nitrogen fix, the root of a nitrogen fixing plant. And how that works, um, atmospheric nitrogen, which makes up most of our, the, the air we breathe, um, is, is generally not available to plants, surprisingly. And even though there's so much in abundance, they just can't use it. Um, it's not in a form they can, they can use. Um, what nitrogen fixing plants do is they, there's bacteria called rhizobium, which uh, colonize the roots of these nitrogen fixers and um, adopt a symbiotic relationship there where they, they provide nitrogen to the plant in exchange for feeding from the plant. So they'll get starches and the things they need from the roots of the plant and in return um, create uh, or pass to the plant uh, nitrogen that they've converted from the atmosphere. This is a sort of a, a bacterial symbiotic relationship with the tree. Mycorrhizae uh, is another uh, naturally occurring symbiotic relationship. I don't know if you've, if you've ever sort of pulled things up from a forest floor and uh, hope you haven't, but <laughs> if you have, you'll often see these networks. They, they look like fine, fine roots all woven together. And what you're looking at is a fungus uh, called micro, mycorrhizae, which um, really are one of the big connectors of of uh, established of, of plants in an established forest, they they share, they look for water and share it. They, um, uh, among other things, they provide um, phosphorus to the root systems of the plant, which is a key um, key nutrient for plant health and plant development and root development in particular. So. This is just to suggest that we have to understand that there's a whole lot of stuff going on and we, we really need to be, um, we need to really encourage it in, in our planning. And we need to make sure we don't do, have any harmful practices too um, in what we're doing on the land. So, um, the nitrogen fixers are, are pretty important, and especially if you're thinking of planting fruit trees, apple trees in particular are really, really happy with nitrogen fixers uh, close by. So you might consider, for example, planting rows of apple trees in um, surrounded by um, clover or alfalfa or uh, lupins or some of the other some of the other nitrogen fixtures. And we'll mention a few of them um, coming up. So I love this picture. I love these old dudes, uh, two old dudes. It looks like ZZ Top go to the nursery down there. So I just had to use this picture. Um, so when you're picking plants, when you're selecting plants for your plan, which remember you will be drawing after you go to Staples to buy all your stuff, um, relate your plant selection to the vision statement. In other words, uh, why are we doing, are we doing this just to grow food? Are we doing this 
or to draw people here? Are we teaching? What are we, you know, relate everything back to the vision statement, I, I suggest. Um, you want, uh, in your plant selection, you want to support the soil health. We talked about rhizobium, mycorrhizae, all of those things, uh, improved soils. Um, and, what, and you want to support wildlife too in your plant selection. Um, you're not going to get all the food. You've got to resign yourself to the fact you're not going to get all the food from your food forest. You, so it's a matter of how much you want to share. Um, so I would also plan for maintenance, think right up front about maintenance and um, especially when you're considering how many people you've got to help you out here. You're working with volunteers and things like that, but plan for low maintenance because uh, that will be a big payoff. And that might, for example, get you into dwarf varieties of, of some trees and shrubs. Uh, dwarf apples, you, if you're around Meaford or Clarksburg or anywhere else where they're putting in new orchards, you, it's pretty astonishing to see um, that they're uh, using espalier and they're using dwarf varieties now and uh, minimizing the people uh, they're on ladders to, uh, to pick and prune and, and do all that work just because it's so much more efficient and effective. Um, the dwarfs are always grafted, uh, as, you, as you probably know, onto a rootstock. So select that so that you get a really, really um, cold hardy um, rootstock that's been developed um, ideally in northern climates. There's a lot of um, apple development going on in uh, places like Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York State, and things like that. And those would be the places to uh, select your, um, your rootstock from. Obviously, you'll be selecting food plants. You'll, you'll probably be looking at healing plants and herbs as well. Um, and really, really important uh, to make sure that your plant selection, this sounds uh, overtly simple, but um, in so many cases, you can put the wrong plant in the wrong place and uh, just make sure the setting is consistent with the culture requirements of the plant. You want to think about output, how, who's going to harvest, how are you going to harvest, what are you going to do with the harvest, that's all part of the, of the vision statement and the work plan. Um, next one is kind of obvious, but when you're dealing with, uh, when you're trying to restore or develop a natural um, system here, such as a food forest, it's really, really critical to make sure that nothing gets runs away. Um, we're going to talk about native plants and the, and the balance that they've shown us uh, over thousands of years in just a second. But it's really, really critical not to introduce something that's going to uh, upset the balance and that you're going to have to work a way to control. Um, pests and controls, um, obviously you're not going to be spraying chemicals to keep the bugs down. You're going to be encouraging things, natural systems to, to help you do that. Um, you've got to think a lot about um, in the high canopy, how you're going to control um, things like squirrels and birds and things like that, getting to things. and. Um, that can be a challenge. You can squirrel guard the trunks of the high trees um, with, you know, just uh, surround them with um, um, something tall and slippery at the base. So, uh, but squirrels are um, pretty adept at hopping from tree to tree and finding their way. So there'll be challenges. Uh, I sure don't suggest you net things because um, overall, because they can, um, trap um, some of the creatures that um, we'd like to protect. So native plants, I'll just give them a nod. And um, generally, I think it's generally accepted that native plants are the ones that um, were here and reproducing themselves naturally before 
uh, European arrival, um, after which people brought all kinds of things, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, um, to Turtle Island here. Um, but native plants are part of an independent relationship developed over thousands of years. So they know, they understand how to coexist with other native species, both plants and animals, without the need to overcompete. The, they, you know, in many cases, the in the prairies, of course, the fire is the, they can deal with fire and reproduce. Uh, some plants need fire to reproduce properly. So they understand how things work. They sustain other life forms um, by providing high quality food, shelter, and nesting materials, and they're successful in their natural environment. They don't rely on all the amendments that we um, rush out to buy and add to our gardens, nor do they need excessive water generally, as long as they're in their own natural place. So now I'm going to encourage you to learn Latin, to rush out and enroll in a Latin course, because um, it's really the only way to understand what you're getting when you're doing plant selection. Uh, you can say, well, yeah, that's a red maple, but most people, when they say red maple, mean those uh, nasty red leaf Norway maples. They don't understand that. Um, the real native Canadian red maple doesn't have a red leaf at all. It has a red stem. So I suggest that this is the only way to know what you're getting. So back in the, back in the uh, mid 1700s, uh, a Swedish um, scientist named Linnaeus developed the, the binomial or the two name system for, for things. So you see the grizzly bear here, Ursus arctus. Um, this, this binomial describes that particular species. So the genus, uh, here's an example in plant, going back to plants, we'll leave the bears to themselves for a minute. Going back to plants, uh, viburnum is a genus. There's many, many, many viburnums, as you know. Um, viburnum dentatum is a species. So it has the genus name and a modifier, or it's called a specific epithet, the dentatum. Then you have a cultivar, which is a kind of a clip word for cultivated variety. Um, and here's an example. These are something that you would see on a, on a plant tag, for example. So uh, uh, I'm just trying to help you um, pay attention to that. So where you see the cultivar name, where you see something blue muffin in quotes, that's a cultivar. A hybrid's got an X in it, um, as you can see. So you'll know that's a hybrid plant. Now, I suggest that um, wherever you can, um, if you're looking for native plants, you're gonna be operating at that species level. Because I think that's that's if if it's for the purpose of supporting wildlife and things like that, I think that's going to be the highest quality. And I and we can see it in our garden. We can see what the what the uh, what the bees and butterflies go for and go to, and and uh, stay away from. So it, it's uh, it's amazing to see. So. If that helps, and there are uh, a few plant nurseries locally. There's um, Ontario Flora down in Flesherton, you may know of, and there's uh, there's uh, Ben Caesar with his, his nursery down in Kimberley. Um, there's 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 people around. And there's many more I haven't named, and I apologize for if I've omitted anybody. But there's many around that specialize in native plant materials, and I would encourage you to seek them out. So these are just a few examples um, by layer, if we go back to the layer idea um, of trees you might consider. So the canopy would include nut trees. Um, for example, the, the hot, these are the big boys. And um, excuse me, I just wanna go back to my notes here for a second. 
So these would be the pecans, the hickories, the, the walnuts, the, uh, uh, the chestnuts, things like that. Uh, maple, if you're, certainly if you're tapping, you'll want some, uh, some, some sugar maples. Um, oak, acorns are really nutritious and make wonderful flour and, and things like that. Um, I've asterisk, <clears throat> excuse me. I've asterisk some of the nitrogen fixers here, just so you can see them. But the um, the black locust is a is a, a great tree for wildlife and for uh, bees and other pollinators, and um, it's a real nitrogen fixer. The understory trees can be your dwarf uh, fruit trees, um, Saskatoons, which are a um, 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 type of service berry. Sea buckthorn, which is a nitrogen fixer, hazel. These are just examples. And then you get into your, into the, and you can argue about whether these belong, you know, whether the elderberries belong in the understory or the shrub, but um, I've just thrown these out as a few examples. Um, elderberries do really well at our, at our food forest uh, at St. George's. Uh, Aronia is another great one that does well. That one does very well in the, sh in the shade. Um, shrub cherry, now that I figured out how to keep the ants off our shrub cherries, we've got, had an incredible crop of those. So uh, that's a great one. The Rugosa rose, the, the, as, as a provider of rose hips is uh, uh, really important. And uh, current bushes, I think you'll find do very well at the, at the shrub layer. So the herbaceous levels, your veggies and herbs and uh, edible flowers and um, and your pollinator, your pollinator supportive plants are, are important. In, in the shady areas, you can put the ramps and, and borage. Uh, I should have, um, yeah, and comfrey, that's another nit nitrogen fixer. Um, they'll do well there. And then for ground cover, the, the native strawberry, you, you may want, um, the, the native strawberry will do very well as a ground cover. Um, it's a uh, smaller fruit, um, but absolutely delicious and would do well. You'll need sun for that. Um, in the shade, winter green, wild ginger will do well. Uh, clover is a great nitrogen fixer around the um, apple trees and around any of the other plants. Uh, red clover is really good for that, makes good tea. And then the root plants can be, again, I'm just throwing a few of many, many examples out here. Um, horseradish, burdock, uh, cattail, Jerusalem artichoke is uh, often overlooked, but that's a, that's a fabulous plant, both as a pollinator supporter and a, um, and a root and a root veg. Um, vines are tough a little bit because um, you really need to get them, most of these out in the sun. So in our layers diagram, where you see a vine crawling up a tree, there's, there's not a whole lot of things other than English ivy, which you do not want, um, that will tolerate that much shade. So you might, uh, you might want to think about opportunities to uh, train them on wires, but uh, definitely get those out in the sunlight. So now you want to think a little bit about the resources um, that you've got. Um, first of all, water collection is critical, and um, you can, uh, if you're blessed with a pond or something like that, that's great. That has its own challenges in terms of uh, safety, you know, keeping things safe from uh, children and things like that, and keeping it uh, properly aerated. Um, so there might be, you know, back to the permaculture thought, you might want to think about um, um, what type of um, wildlife can help you keep the pond clean, what type of plant materials uh, would be appropriate both for the edge and in the pond, those kinds of things, if you've got, if you've got, um, if you're blessed with a pond. The little picture at the top right shows our water collection system at the food forest, and it's, um, that just off our shed, which is like 10 by 20 ish, um, we get about five or 6,000 liters um, in a season. Um, if we 
if we doubled up or if we used two or three totes, we'd collect more because obviously in a rainstorm that fills up that fills up pretty quick and overflows. So that's the overflows water we can't use. So um, we'll probably explore twinning that, at least putting one more tank beside that one. That's a thousand liter tote and you see them everywhere for very little money. They're often on people's front lawns as you go by a farm. Uh, wind power, you might, if you're, if you're in a, a nice open territory and you have the uh, availability to um, use wind power, that can either pump water up for you, uh, well water up for you, or it can oxygenate a pond for you, or it can generate electricity for you. So there's a huge opportunity to, to do great things there. Um, solar panels on the shed you built to collect water and store your tools would be would be ideally too, ideal too. And you can um, um, you can have battery banks to run things that you might need from time to time off that. Um, people is uh, is huge. Like um, who's going to help you? Who's going to manage it? Who's going to run it? Um, volunteerism is a whole. <laughs> world that's uh, I must confess is a bit of a mystery to me. I don't know anybody's really mastered the art um, yet. Many many books are written about it, um, but um, attracting, inspiring, uh, managing, coaching volunteers is uh, is a is a study unto itself, and it's uh, it it can be frustrating, rewarding, and all of those things. So, um, so just understanding that uh, the people as, as a resource and an inspiration is really important. Also, where's the money coming from? I took a picture of the center console of my car there because it was convenient. That's, that's uh, <laughs> um, but, um, You'll need a you'll need to do a budget and and uh, when you're doing your planning, plan it and stage it in such a way that it's manageable. Um, don't plan, don't develop it beyond the capacity to manage it and look after it and care for it in terms of people. And obviously, don't develop it beyond the budget, or it's going to be uh, it's going to be really really tough. So with that, I'm gonna close with this little quote, which I'll let you read. Um, and I thank you for your attention and your interest. And um, I'd welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Thomas. I'll let everyone to read the Paul quote, stick a time. At least I need the time. <laughs> yeah. well, I made a big grant. Wonderful. I wonder uh, how did you um, how did you end up with so much money from the food forest? Oh well, we can't discuss that in this open forum. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa is laughing. Okay, uh, ready for questions? So I will start with the first one. So the first question was um, about the vertical climber. The vertical climbers uh, could be such a wild grape wine and can kill trees. Do you recommend thinning out a forest to plant the seven layers? Oh, that's, uh, that's pretty challenging. Um, this goes back to your site inventory question a little, a, a little bit. In, 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 as I said, I think I said it's, uh, it's easier to create shade than sun. So you may say we've got to we've got to do some you may say we've got to do some thinning here. And it may be that um, that there are trees that are um, unwell or there may be species that you don't want there or, or don't particularly need there, um, such as that Norway maple I mentioned. Um, or um, uh, or Manitoba maple, uh, you know, there's other trees that won't really do you much good. So 
you'll have to make that assessment. Um, I'd be reluctant to, if, if you've got a good established um, um, tree canopy that's been there for some time, I'd be reluctant to mess with it too much. I'd maybe look for other ways to, to pull what you're planting away from them if you can. But it all, I guess it'll all come down to how much space you have. I mean, if you've got, um, if you've got a totally shaded piece of property and that's where you want to make the food forest, then you'll have to do some selective thinning. Um, the ideal would be to leave it alone and, uh, and find the sun by backing away from it a little bit. Thank you. Next question, what are a few key species of endangered declining native plants that we can aid in reinstating locally? And where might be uh, the best collect seed seedlings from to do so? Sorry, did, did, I, uh, did I hear you ask about what, what plants might be in decline that we could? Endangered species, uh, declining native uh, plants. Yeah. Um, I don't. I, I don't really know the answer to that one. I mean, I know there's some things like um, like hickory that are that are challenged. Um, that and it's a it's a beautiful tree, um, and it's um, it used to be that we were on the edge of its uh, of its natural territory, but now with with warming, they, it's uh, become what much more naturalized. Up this way, um, but I don't know. Um, you want to select plants, I think, that are um, wildlife supportive when you're thinking about that. So I would, uh, I would suggest milkweed, for example, would be a, a really important. Um, it's, I think, people are becoming much more aware of its vital importance to the monarch um, for habitat and food. But it's still generally considered, uh, especially in many farming communities, as a weed. So any plant that like, like that that's typically at risk, um, um, I would make sure you include that. So milkweed, uh, Joe pie weed is a really, really important uh, pollinator plant, and it's a beauty. Um, so if um, if in your plan you can include like a really wild area where you can just uh, let things grow and, and populate that with pollinator plants like Joe Pye and uh, and this and the several species of, of uh, milkweed, um, I think that would be really important. Thank you, Thomas. So I think that the next question is related to the native plants as well. So what would you recommend where we can get the local native plant supplies? Um, I would say, uh, I would look up Ontario flora and I can, if anybody afterwards, if anybody wants, um, um, a, a direct connection, I can provide, um, I don't have it handy, but, um, if you just Google Ontario flora, um, mm -hmm. you'll find that it's, uh, her, um, She's around Flesherton, between Flesherton and Markdale, I believe, with her nursery there. And she has an online catalog of what's available. And um, she's visited our food forest. I've had the, had the pleasure of meeting her. Um, um, she's, uh, I've forgotten her name. She's the sister of, uh, of the lady who has uh, Hartwood Home, uh, Joanna Bottrell's sister. I've forgotten her first name. Teresa, you may remember her first name, but I've forgotten. Anyway, um, email, anyone's welcome to email me later with, with questions like that, like um, where can I go for this? Where can I go for that? And I'll, I'll do my best. So can I share that. your email address? Pardon me? Can I share your email address? Of course. Yeah. Perfect, uh, I can do that. It's just my name.ca. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No, I'm happy to share uh, Thomas's address for people who are interested to um, reach out to him uh, for any 
uh, sources um, of native plants. I'm sure there are a number of people on this uh, call that can uh, maybe provide their uh, inputs. Feel free to share. Yes, I'm sure there are, mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody put, put onplants.ca, St. Williams Nursery. Um, somebody reached out to me actually the other day that they have a number of uh, milkweed plants that they are happy to share. Um, Great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, feel free to share uh, anything you have. Um, I'm continuing to ask you a question. So one of the questions was, how do you keep the ends of your shrub cherries? Oh, Any tips? cinnamon. Cinnamon. Yep. I love cinnamon. Cinnamon, cinnamon powder around the base of the, uh, you do it uh, two or three times in the spring. Just keep uh, maybe um, a foot in diameter. I don't know how far ants can jump, but you want to go a little further than ants can jump. Um, it was dramatic, the difference in the um, uh, between one year and the next, uh, both in terms of visible ants on the tree and, and the output uh, of, of the trees was phenomenal. That's a great uh, advice. Our next question is about uh, black locus. Uh, you mentioned that it's a nitrogen fixer, but it does spread quickly with a robust root system. Can you recommend or comment further on this uh, place in a garden? Um, comment further on where you'd place it. Or what do you do with black locus if it's so robust or when it grows so quickly? You can do chop and, gr uh, chop and drop, but uh, what else can you do with uh, black locus if it's too um, strong rooted, I guess? That's the question. You mean you want to get rid of it? Um, yeah, can you plan? I don't understand. I don't think I mm -hmm. So as a, it, the concern is that um, black locust spreads quickly with a robust root system. Oh, yes, it's, it's quite, yes, it is assertive, uh, but it's, uh, it's also, so you have to balance that. You can, you, can, you can certainly trim the canopy. You can, if there's any, um, it's also very prolific seeder. If you've seen the big long seed pods uh, associated with the locusts. So uh, yeah, definitely control the uh, progeny of the, of the tree. Um, I leave it to you whether, I wouldn't suggest removing it unless it's very much in the way of the, your other plants. But uh, um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily let it spread forever because it can take over other things. Thank you. Um, question about current. Uh, current bushes are, uh, I don't think that current bushes are native and they are host uh, for one of the life cycle stages of white pine rust. Right. What do you think, what do you think about that? What do you, how do I you? I don't know, frankly, I don't know about that. Um, so I can't really speak to that. I, I know we've, we've had good luck with, uh, with um, our current bushes. Uh, in terms of nothing going after them. So um, it might be a matter of, uh, it might be like the cedar apple rust where, um, where the um, um, Eastern red cedar, which is really a juniper, getting back to learning Latin. Um, um, Eastern red cedar is, uh, uh, it's very dangerous to have anywhere near apples because uh, cedar apple rust is a, is a horrible disease. So um, that might be a situation where uh, there is a host plant. Sounds like, was it white pine? Um, was that part yeah, of the name of the? The, the, uh, the concern was that um, it was the white pine rust. Uh, yeah. one of the problem that uh, would host uh, on the current bushes. Yeah. Well, you know, I, again, I, I can't speak to it because I don't understand it, but if it, if it, if it relates to um, um, the white pine being a host for a problem that bothers the um, current, then it's a matter of uh, 
choosing one or the other. Do you want the white pine more than the current? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, next question is about ponds. Uh, I have a stream with a wetland and would like to plan to attract water fall. I'm not sure what the question means, but uh, seems like um, they would like to plan to attract waterfall. Waterfall? Uh, mm -hmm. Ducks, ducks, geese, things like that. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm going through this long questions. Um, do you have any advice what steps we can take this first year to make sure that we get off a good start in becoming a more eco-conscious garden center and nursery? That's a person who is going to be a part of uh, the team at Grey Heron in Meaford. Um, we are hoping to slowly transition the place into becoming a great spot for anybody interested in permaculture native plants and getting involved. What would be your uh, advice to us uh, for our Grey Heron Garden Center? For the what Garden with... Center? I'm sorry. Oh. Grey Heron. Grey Heron. Oh, yes. After okay. Ormsby. Mm -hmm. Formerly Ormsby. Yes. Um, I would, uh, I would certainly make it known that you're, that you have, um, that you intend to specialize in native plants uh, for one. Um, get that out there, uh, and maybe uh, maybe separate the native plants in in their into their own display, so people can come and and um, or or at least highlight them either by color coding um, the identifying markers and things like that. I would certainly start to eliminate any um, um, plants that are um, invasive or species that. Um, you know, I get back to my Norway maple story. Um, I would certainly start to not carry those. Um, if you look up, um, if you do a little study on um, um, Ontario invasive plants, you'll find many plants that um, you might want to consider not selling anymore. Um, periwinkle among them, English ivy among them. Um, Lamium, um, there's a whole lot of invasives out there that are still, uh, and I'm not suggesting that gray heron is doing this now, but there's a whole lot of, uh, of invasives out there that uh, nurseries are happily selling and people are happily buying, but it's really a matter of maybe spending a little more time to educate the buyer about why you're not carrying this. And I think that would really, really set you apart as uh, as a sort of a champion for good in uh, in landscaping. So more nitrogen fixing and native plants and yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, time for last question, Thomas. I know we have almost perfect timing. Can you suggest the food forest layers and maybe a few species? That would applicable that would be applicable in proximity to a septic bed. Consideration for what kinds of wood food would be safe to harvest in proximity. So it's a oh. septic bed and fruit trees or shrubs. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, I guess proximity is is the uh, is the key. Are we talking about um, planting right on top? Um, I think I would um, I would maybe stay away from uh, food plants, except that that would be the ideal place I think for pollinator plants. Um, um, but in terms of putting, in terms of harvesting mint from the top of a septic field uh, for use in tea, I might not be too excited about that personally. <laughs> so that's a great place for for shallow rooted pollinator plants in my view. Uh, not the deep guys like the nitrogen fixing lupine and things like that, but the, uh, um, the shallower pollinator supportive plants would be ideal there. I think I'd stay away from the food. Yeah, 
Let's do the flowers. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, big uh, uh, thank you to you, uh, Thomas, for being with us tonight. And uh, if anybody has a question, then they can email you or email me. Feel free to uh, stay in touch. And um, yeah, and let's plant more uh, edible trees. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Thanks Thomas. So yeah, have a good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.